is example 12 of our partial fractions topic. And what we have here is an improper rational function. And we're going to work with these types of functions with our partial, fr with our partial fractions. The problem is that we can only use make partial fractions of a proper rational function. A proper rational function is one where the order of the numerator is less than the order of the denominator. We have a look at the highest order terms in these. We've got x cubed, that's an order 3, divided by x squared, which is order 2. 3 is bigger than 2. We actually have an improper top-heavy fraction. If you think about it in number terms, we have an improper rational function. So we cannot split that up just into partial fractions straight away. We have to use a little bit of algebraic long division. And the warning of the question tells us that it says express the rational function as a polynomial function plus partial fractions. And what that means is the polynomial function is the quotient or the answer to our algebraic long division. We're going to take our remainder and make a proper rational function, which we can then split into partial fractions. It's going to be a cracker. So the first thing we need to do is get on with our algebraic long division. So what can we do with that? We're going to draw our division step. We're going to write inside x cubed minus x squared minus 5x minus 7. And we're dividing that by x squared minus 2x minus 3. So rules for algebraic long division, as we've covered before, take the highest order in the dividend, highest order in the divisor, and we do that division x cubed divided by x squared is x. So we're going to put our answer just above the x in our dividend just to keep the the, the, the places or the place value the same as our x column. So if x is the answer to that particular calculation, we then have to multiply x by x squared minus 2x minus 3. That gives us x cubed minus 2x squared minus 3x. We're going to subtract that from the term above. And just to re remind ourselves that we're subtracting everything, I tend to put a wee bracket around everything because we've got some, we're subtracting negative terms later on here. So let's check x cubed minus x cubed is zero. Effectively, that should go to zero. If it doesn't go to zero, you've done something wrong at that point. However, the second thing is you've got to watch out for here. We've got negative x squared minus negative 2x squared. And that's the same as negative x squared plus 2x squared. So watch, it becomes an addition calculation. Negative x squared plus 2x squared is 1x squared. And the same thing happens with the negative 5x. Subtract negative 3x becomes negative 5x plus 3x. So we've got negative 2x here. So just watch that you remember that we're subtracting right at the beginning of that expression. We haven't used the minus 7. It's going to hidden over there. So we're going to bring the negative 7 down. And we've got a new term to divide. So let's have a look at the highest term is x squared. And again, we're dividing it by the x squared in our divisor. x squared divided by x squared is plus 1. And we're going to do 1 times x squared minus 2x minus 3, which happens to be x squared minus 2x minus 3. We're going to subtract that from the term above. x squared minus x squared is 0, as it should do. Negative 2x minus negative 2x again gives us an addition calculation. Negative 2x plus 2x is 0 as well. So that it produces no term. All that we actually can do with this is we can say that negative 7 subtract negative 3 is negative 7 plus 3, which is negative 4. We've got no other terms to bring down. A negative 4 is a lower order term than the original 
divisor our x squared, therefore we cannot divide uh, by x squared. Negative 4 is our remainder, which means that we can then effectively stop our long division and we can go back to working out how to rewrite our original rational function. So we started off with x cubed minus x squared minus 5x minus 7 over x squared minus 2x minus 3. And what we can see is that that is equal to this expression up here, the x plus 1. That's what is called our rational, or our polynomial function, sorry, the way back at the beginning, express it as a polynomial function plus partial fractions. Our polynomial function is x plus 1. Our remainder, negative 4, we can write as m minus 4 over the original denominator. So we've got x plus 1 minus 4 over x squared minus 2x minus 3. Now, although that's uh, probably the best way to write that in the end, what I'm going to do is suggest, because we're going to break this uh, term up here into partial fractions, I'm going to suggest to avoid potential error, that we actually keep that as a plus sign and we keep the numerator as negative 4 just now. And that means that when we do eventually find our partial fractions for that, we can just slot them on as fractions adding on to x plus 1. If we make that a minus sign and then just work with the 4 as a positive term, all your partial fractions will have to be effectively multiplied by negative 1 and you might forget to do that. So. That's why, although I would normally say bring the, the negative to the beginning of the fraction, at this stage, let's keep it as negative 4. So we want to take the last fraction here, and we want to do the, our partial fractions work. In other words, we want to take negative 4 divided by x squared minus 2x minus 3, and split that up into uh, partial fractions. We can't do that until we factorize the denominator and see what we've got. So can we factorise it to factors of negative 3 that add together to give us negative 2. Now that's going to be negative 3 and plus 1. We have two distinct linear factors. Therefore, we can represent that as being something over x minus 3 plus something over x plus 1. We're going to then go into stage 2 of our partial fractions, multiply by the denominator. On the left hand side, we've just got the numerator. And on the right hand side, in turn, we can work out what our expression is going to be. Negative x minus 3 cancel out, which gives us a times x plus 1. And in the second one, the x plus 1s cancel out and we're left with plus b times x minus 3. We can select a suitable value for x. In the first instance, I'll take let x equal negative 1. We don't have an x term on the left-hand side, so we're always just going to write down um, the constant term. Negative 4 is equal to the a term is going to disappear and my b term will be negative 1 minus 3, substituting in. We can say that negative 4 is equal to negative 4b, which means that b takes the value of 1. Secondly, if we let x equal to 3, then our second term will go to 0. say here, and x is 3, that negative 4 is equal to a multiplied by 3 plus 1, and a second term uh, is going to go to 0. So we can say negative 4 is equal to 4a, a is therefore negative 1. 
that means that we've got the constant terms for our partial fractions. Uh, looking back up here, we can see that here's our values of a and b. a is going to be negative 1, so you're going to have negative 1 over x minus 3, and we're going to have plus 1 over x plus 1. But what we want to do is to put that all together in one final uh, conclusion. It means that the original rational function, x cubed minus x squared minus 5x minus 7 divided by x squared minus 2x minus 3 can be represented by a polynomial function, which we've already decided uh, back up there is x plus 1. And then we've got our two fractions. We've got uh, our fraction that was x plus 1, and our fraction that was x minus 3. We know that a is negative 1, so we'll put negative 1 in there, and our value of b is positive 1. And there is our answer. We've expressed the, the improper rational function, which is on the left-hand side, as a polynomial expression, which is x plus 1 plus partial fractions. And just as a little footnote, the reason that I can just put these constant terms, negative 1 and 1 straight in there, was because I kept the negative 4 in my uh, remainder fraction. Had I not done so, I would have had to have basically multiplied uh, each of those fraction values by negative 1. So that's why it's good to keep a positive sign in front of the the remainder fraction, even if you have to carry the negative number into the partial fraction calculation. Okay, a lot of work there. Uh, it's quite a long process, but uh, it's a good one to do. It's good to practice, and in time you should be able to do it quite quickly.